thank you. Uh, thank you to B-Sides Boston for having me. Um, and thank you everyone here for uh, attending. Um, I'm kind of bummed that we can't be in person um, and that I can't really see everyone's reactions. Um, but that's okay because at least one of us can uh, pretend that everyone else laughed at my jokes. <clears throat> so anyway, let's uh, let's start this. And as a warning, there's a big picture of me in the next screen, so it might break your computer screen. Sorry. Uh, if I can hit the next button. Hey, there we go. Uh, so who am I? Um, I'm Dmitry Zagatsky. Uh, you can trust me because I have a CISSP. Uh, <laughs> Uh, not really. I mean, I do, but you can trust me because uh, I'm passionate about what I talk about, and uh, I I do a lot of research, and I'm not afraid to be uh, admit when I'm wrong. So currently, I am the AVP of IT Security uh, at uh, Protected Credit Union in Rhode Island. Um, I also do a lot of stuff with uh, with DC 401. I participate in Splunk Boston User Group. I do the Boston Security Meetup. Uh, I haven't really done a lot of talking at conferences. Uh, kind of, I've been stuck with um, thinking no one would care what the heck I want to talk about because uh, I'm not like this big uh, like security researcher or whatever. Uh, but this topic I kind of um, stumbled on and uh, I'm really passionate about and uh, I want to share some of the experience that I've had. Um, one stupid fact, I guess, is that this picture is the only selfie I've ever taken of myself. Uh, it was a uh, submission for the first Layer 8 conference uh, for the OSINT CTF. Um, and I've also been described as a person with a personal vendetta against penetration testers, which uh, is totally not true. I'm actually kind of a, a pen test fanboy. Uh, I think that pen testing is awesome, and I wish I had the skills to, uh, to take over computer systems uh, as, as well as the next guy, but uh, I'm stuck here defending them. So anyway, let's uh, let's go on. So um, what are we going to be talking about in this presentation? Uh, there's a few things that, that we're going to be doing. Uh, first, we're going to go over a quick baseline of you know, what is a pen test and what isn't a pen test. Um, how to pick a company that's a good fit for you. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of different vendors out there and a lot of different companies. And what I've seen is that it really matters that you get someone that's a good fit. It might not be the, you know, it's there's there's uh, there's a bunch of different ways to uh, to get someone there. Uh, things to look for in contracts. Contracts are the are what kind of just runs everything. And so there's a few things you really want to make sure that you uh, look out for and that you have included. Um, also, when you're done, uh, obviously the thing you're looking for is a report that says what happened. So there's a lot of things uh, you should look out for, and um, you know that you that you want to do with all the reporting. Mostly, this is a kind of a collection of things that I wish I knew when uh, I first started. There's not really a lot of resources available for the the customer side or the blue team side on the pen tests. So uh, a lot of the a lot of the things on pen testing are from the perspective of, hey, I want to be a pen tester, or I want to know how to you know, own a Windows system. Uh, Philip Wiley did an awesome presentation earlier on you know, how to become a pen tester. Uh, so this is, this is a perspective from the, from the other side. Um, also, a warning, there's uh, going to be some minor spoilers from the, for the Phoenix project. Um, so uh, hopefully, uh, mostly, I, I hope everyone's kind of read it because it's an awesome book. It really, uh, it really changed my perspective on a lot of things. Uh, and it's at this point like seven or eight years old, so I think it's safe for spoilers. Um, if there's anything else you want spoiled, uh, everyone dies in Romeo and Juliet. So you know, sorry. Um, what this isn't is I'm not trying to uh, bash pen testers or companies. Uh, some of the things presented here might make some uh, some people look. Uh, not the best, and that's not really my my goal. Uh, I really want I really want to provide people with information as again how how you can get a good fit for your organization, and um, not trying you know trying to show like what what could happen, but not necessarily that it's always the case. Uh, also, I'm not going to be naming any names. Uh, so this is a lot of the stuff is uh, 
covered under NDAs and other things. But again, this is trying to, I try to uh, take uh, some experiences of mine and others and, and put a positive spin and more generalized for, um, uh, you know, a kind of a broader audience. Also, uh, unfortunately, this is not going to be a comprehensive guide on how to do everything. Uh, it's probably going to take a lot more time than an hour uh, to, to do that. But, <clears throat> excuse me, um, it's, we're going to try to get it through and I'll be available for questions uh, at the end. Uh, and even now I'm on Discord, so, uh, you know, we'll see how it goes. Okay, so, uh, what is a pen test? Uh, this is a collection of pens, and they all squiggle and, and, and work really nicely. Uh, a while ago on a Twitter, I asked, uh, you know, what, what is a pen test? And I kind of asked for, for wrong answers, just for jokes. Um, and the problem is that it's it's the kind of thing that you... You know it when you see it, but there's a lot of different interpretations uh, as to as to what really constitutes a pen test, and I feel like there really shouldn't be, uh, and it's kind of a problem in the industry. Uh, when I first when I first started shopping for pen tests in in some roles, like I thought I knew what a pen test was, and I thought that everyone else knew what a pen test was, and I kind of you know some of the the things were lulled into a, a maybe a false sense of security. Um, so here's, here's a few things. Uh, here's the original sandbox escapers. Uh, there's pigs testing their pen, uh, not a pen test. Uh, here's Penn Jillette writing on a pen, uh, not a pen test. Although someone said that Teller talking to pen might have been. And then there's this. Uh, here's a tweet from Tinker. Uh, you should follow him on Twitter. He's an awesome dude. Um, and this kind of illustrates the the problem is getting more serious so the most common wrong answer for that people would give for what a pen test is is just you know it's just a vulnerability report with you know a few extra things tacked on and it really isn't uh it it, it shouldn't be and um you know this this kind of this kind of uh mentality uh is is still pretty prevalent so here's uh, a lot of words, and uh, this is probably the best explanation uh, that I could find for what actually is a pen test. And so this is in the NIST uh, 800-115 publication, the Technical Guide to Cybersecurity Testing and Auditing, I believe. Uh, so the the highlight is mine, but it's uh, you know it's a test that mimics real world, real world attacks and identifying a ways to circumvent security features in a system or a network. Usually you would involve, you know, launching real attacks on real systems. And the most important part is that a pen test consists of uh, combining vulnerabilities in one or more systems that you can use to then chain and gain more access than you could achieve just through a single vulnerability or an exploit. Um, a lot of things, so the, and then the, the things at the bottom, are uh, you know where is it? Uh, are you know some of the some of the, the reasons uh, that you would want to get one? Pretty much at the end of the day, you get a pen test, um, not necessarily because your compliance program says you need to, but that's usually a driving factor. Uh, you get a pen test to verify your security program's effectiveness. It's you know it's the the dry run of of what everything you know everything you you've done. Uh, to to set everything up, and that uh, you you know you're getting you're testing against real real style attacks, hopefully uh, against a real person uh, who can who can put together things and maybe see some aspects of your systems that you didn't realize, um, and and really get you some meaningful insight on how you can improve your security posture overall. So there's a few different kinds. Of <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, we're going to go over a few different kinds uh, just to set the baseline for what uh, what's involved. So uh, there's the external pen and test, which is uh, pretty much just everything that is visible externally from the internet um, that belongs to you. This is really useful for, for testing uh, public-facing systems, customer-facing systems, 
you know, VPN gateways, uh, anything cloud-based, uh, things like that. It's pretty much what can a person anywhere on the planet see. Uh, next, uh, a more important, I, I feel, is an internal pen test. This is where an attacker would start inside of the perimeter, which with the way the technology uh, is going, you know, everyone's saying the perimeter is dead, so we'll see how that what that means in a few years. But pretty much uh, you would start, uh, you would have, the, have an attacker system inside of your network or inside of your cloud environment or, or somewhere else. It's really good to simulate, uh, you know, someone clicking on a phishing link uh, some kind of a malicious ex, uh, malicious insider activity, uh, or or just some other exploit where you want to just see what happens if something you know gets in. Uh, forget about how good your perimeter defenses are. Let's see what a worst case scenario looks like. Uh, typically, you would you would start these in a, they're from the perspective of a normal user, um, but if you feel uh, if you feel spicy, you can have things start from inside of like a server segment or uh, some other privileged security zone to see, you know, just explore different other op options um, for uh, testing. So there's also the different ways, uh, the different amount of knowledge that the attacker has gained. Um, knowledge is power. Uh, so the first kind is a no knowledge test. Uh, this is only available. This is only giving the attackers or the pen test company um, what's available through OSINT or scanning. Uh, it typically simulates, uh, you know, just what's publicly accessible. And again, almost almost always, this is with all of your defensive measures turned on. Uh, this can also be known as a black box test. And this is typically, uh, you know, it's a good starting point. Uh, to, Sometimes you may uh, you may want to restrict this uh, to you know to kind of give the attackers a real uh, a real hard work a uh, real hard job to do. Um, usually you you would want to go uh, with something a little bit better or not better, but uh, so the next kind is a full knowledge test. This is where the uh, the testers would have as much information as they need. Uh, that could be the design of the controls, the kind of systems are in use, um, addresses uh, of high value targets that they might want to try to pivot towards. Um, and if you really want to get clever, you can choose to uh, allow, uh, allow the systems past certain defenses so that you can test what happens if that defense fails or if they can uh, somehow bypass it. And you don't want to have to go through the effort of actually having the, the testers attempt to bypass because not every security tool system process is 100% infallible. Uh, it's really good to have uh, it's really good to have an opportunity to see what happens when when certain things fail and then get real a good idea of your defense in depth. Um, and then the next is a partial knowledge test, otherwise known as a gray box test. This is realistically where most tests actually happen. You get kind of a combination of you know, uh, of, of the two previous methods. Um, however, my personal favorite is uh, a gated test. That is where you start with no knowledge, and then as the test progresses, you disclose additional information to see if you can get different results. So for example, you'd start with, you know, a no knowledge test and see how far uh, an attacker can go. And then you say, okay, well, here's all the defenses you're actually hitting and you're being blocked by them. Okay. So now that they know all of that information, can they deduce a way around that they couldn't that uh, through other you know other means? This really kind of uh, uh, it it avoid it, it's it's good and it avoids having them spend too much time wait not wasting time but spending too much time on OSINT when you know in a real world attack you know the a determined uh, a determined malicious actor has as much time as they want and realistically in a pen test you've got, uh, there's a time bound. So um, it's a good way to simulate a more sophisticated attacker. So we're gonna start with a little bit of a story here. Um, and <clears throat> with, uh, I figured the Phoenix Project would be a good launching point uh, for, for this because a lot of this, it seems like a lot of the stuff in the Phoenix Project, if you've read it, has a basis in truth. 
And uh, a lot of times, a lot of uh, the people I've talked to who've read it, they kind of associate certain characters with people that they actually know in their um, in their day to day job and, and life and things. So for the people who uh, might not have read it, a quick uh, a quick overview of the characters is um, there is Bill Palmer, who is the head of IT and is typically the protagonist of the book. Uh, there's John Pesci, uh, who is the chief security officer. And there's Sarah Moulton, who is kind of, he's the head of sales, I believe, and she's kind of the antagonist. Um, there's Brent, who is like a top-notch IT engineer who kind of uh, gets everything done. And they're working on a large uh, application that they call Project Phoenix. So in the beginning, uh, in the beginning of the book, the uh, the previous CIO and the and the VP of IT are um, for for reasons that aren't disclosed are they're fired, and that's how the, the 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 story starts, where Bill Palmer gets suddenly promoted into being the the, the director of IT, and he sort of befriends John, the security officer, who keeps trying to give him. Uh, you know, put, tell them all these things that are wrong with all the systems regarding security. So, um, John's been pretty much chomping at the bit to uh, to do an in-depth pen test because he wasn't really allowed to prior to the the departure of the two previous uh, people. They always, you know, said that they didn't have issues. They weren't really any issues. They didn't need an internal test, and they didn't want to have to deal with any possible downtime. So John thinks that now that Bill's in charge, um, they have an opportunity to do some some real good. So um, let's they say, okay, let's let's pen test Project Phoenix. It's the new big thing. Um, let's see what we can do. Uh, so, oh, sorry, my slides here uh, out of order, but that's okay. So John says he found a great company. He's read an article about them in a you know in an industry magazine. Pen testers are us. Um, and you know they seem pretty good. So uh, Bill agrees, and then John's like, "Well, do we want to do anything else other than that? We, you know, we've got pretty much everything is our, you know, we can we can do whatever we want." Um, so Bill suggests, "Can they test some of Sarah's stuff?" Uh, Sarah's been getting in Bill's way a lot, and he wants him to test the the in-store systems. He feels that they're probably like the people there probably aren't managing it right, and really wants to get Sarah in trouble, so that way she can get off his back. Okay, so they got that down, and John wants to schedule it for January, February. So, some of you might have kind of figured from that part of the story that there's a few, <clears throat> there's a few uh, uh, traps here waiting for them. But oh man, okay, sorry. My this slide was supposed to auto, uh, only show the the part. The okay, never mind. Sorry. Okay, so pretty much, how do you do goal? How do you set goals and scoping for uh, your your test? Um, it's your environment. You you realistically should know where all the bodies are buried. Uh, so if you don't know where you've got some weaknesses or gaps, or if you have the ability to, uh, you know, defend against a sophisticated attack, you should probably work on that first. Um, you really kind of want to have a good idea, a good vulnerability manager program going, uh, and, and everything else. Um, the other thing is you need to determine what's important to you, and that's different for every organization. Um, is it your data? Is it the system? Is it the availability of your systems? Um, is it web apps that take customer information or shopping carts or VPN portals? Is it Active Directory? Do you have a lot of Wi-Fi access points for guest access or something like that? Uh, it really kind of depends. And again, it's uh, it's if you if you don't know what what you what's important and what deserves testing, then you probably should start there. Uh, the other thing is, uh, do you want to test in production? Are you going to test it in the test environment, a QA environment, DR? Um, each of those things carry different uh, caveats. So like if you're testing in production, great. It's a really good test. 
But if you break something, you're breaking live production systems. Is that a risk you want to take? Um, and then, you know, for the test and the QA and DR, uh, so they're, you know, they're not the live production systems, but are you sure that they're configured the same way as production? And then can, you know, can stand in for production. Uh, and, you know, if you're getting audited for compliance, does that, does that meet the smell test kind of? Uh, the other time is you may want to just say, I want to test DR or, or a test system uh, specifically because they want to see if your, you know, if your controls there are just as good as on production. Because uh, a lot of times, you know, DR controls aren't as good. So why would somebody attack production when they can just steal the backups and be done with it? Um, the next thing is you want to see what are you what are you actually looking to measure? Um, are you do you care about the technical controls? So well, your firewalls, your IDSs, uh, IPSs, uh, WAFs, all those different things. Yeah, all the blinky lights. You want to make sure that you're getting the bang for the buck. Um, do you want to uh, make sure that your teams have the ability to detect certain attacks? Um, do you want to make sure that everyone's adhering to a certain process? So, you know, if they do detect it, do they follow the playbook that, that you guys had, had set up? You can have everything set up 100% well, well, you get a detection and just staff just isn't well trained uh, or, you know, doesn't follow what, what you expect. Uh, you, you get weird results, and, and a lot of times um, a pen test might, might kind of highlight those things. Uh, next, do you want to include social engineering, any physical bypass, or, or something along those lines? Um, as, as you may have heard, uh, the weak link is really usually in, in, uh, in layer 8, uh, wink, wink. Uh, so it's uh, a lot of, you know, it's, it's important to do that uh, as part of a test. And you kind of sometimes you have to be a little bit um, delicate with with how you scope it and what you what you are uh, okay with. You kind of have to determine what level of evil uh, you're okay with performing uh, on your own employees, and then and then see see how that goes. It's um, it's 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 a delicate situation. It's it's sometimes hard to uh, to do. Uh, the next thing is. You do not want to try to make someone look bad or hang someone out to dry. That is a bad idea. Even though it's so, like a lot of times you say, "Oh, you hear, okay, yeah, we're going to own this system, uh, and you know, and and get domain admin credentials, and it's going to be great." And yeah, you know, you can you think, okay, I'm going to sick my pen testers on this other people, and and show how they're not actually doing their job the right way. That is a bad idea. If you that that just breeds problems, um, it might you know it might pass your mind, but you can't have that be um, realistically any any part of of what uh, of of what you're doing. Uh, so after you go through this exercise, uh, you should end up with uh, actually a bunch of different scopes or a bunch of different goals uh, for um, for different opportunities. And what you want to do is you want to collect them all down and you know keep track of them, um, because realistically, in a, in a in a test where it's time bound, you don't really want to just say, okay, just do everything. Uh, okay, somebody can do everything, and it'll take a month and a half or more, and they'll charge you, you know, lots and lots and lots of money, and that's not really, you know, you don't want that's not a, a really an effective use of anyone's time. Um, so. If you if you scope things properly, you can you can test specific things and then have some kind of you know room for discovery to say okay hey yeah we saw this thing that's really bad uh, but it's not necessarily in scope do you want to go and um, you know do we want to go and, and look after it and you should be open to saying yes go after it as a customer okay so for the security weekly listeners I hope you have your drinking glasses. Uh, handy because we're about to mention some hot topics. Where do you start to look for vendors? Other than Google, you can Google, you know, pen testers in my area or, or whatever. And that pen testers in my area just probably ends up on a dating site. But um, as silly as it sounds, the PCI approved scanned vendor list is not a bad place to start. 
many PCI vendors offer pen testing services because PCI compliance requires that you do pen testing. Uh, it, you know, it's it's a place to start. <clears throat> also, financial auditors. Um, it's again, I was a little bit surprised when I when I first ran across this, but it's true. Uh, financial audit firms um, do pen tests. The only thing is, is you you want to be careful about um, the appearance of a conflict of interest or or any kind of uh, in, incorrect separation of duties, um, because the um, you know if you've got the same people who are auditing your financials, auditing your IT controls, and then doing the pen test that verifies the IT controls, that might be too much in one, you know, too many eggs in one basket for um, for like a regulator or a compliance audit or anything like that. Um, doesn't mean it's bad, but you wanna just take that into account. Next is uh, event sponsors. You guys are all at an InfoSec event, and oftentimes companies that do excellent pen testing sponsor InfoSec events. I hear there might be one that sponsors this one, but I'm not gonna name names. Uh, so, you know, it's a good opportunity, uh, especially to kind of like not really have any pressure. Uh, if we ever do anything in person, um, you know, go to, the, go to a booth at an event, say, you know, ask some of the questions that we, that we might go over here and get a, you know, get a quick feel for, for how the company operates, um, you know, and it's one way to, to find them. Uh, also, word of mouth. Uh, everything, everything is great with word of mouth. Uh, recommendations from, from colleagues, friends, other people in the industry uh, really carry a lot of weight. Uh, the problem is, is that you just need to make sure that every company is different. So if you, um, you know, so, something that's a good fit for someone else might not necessarily be a good fit for you, but it's a good place to start. So once you're talking to uh, a vendor, what should you ask? Uh, there's a bunch of stuff. But first thing you wanna do is pretty much, you wanna determine how they operate. How, what's, their, um, what's their methodology? Um, you know, you can ask a question like, you know, what describe a typical engagement to me? Uh, you know, how do you start? Where does it go from there? Uh, they should be going over thing, uh, you know, different phases of the engagement like recon, vulnerability identification, exploitation, uh, what they do for reporting, uh, things like that. Um, if the test is gonna, trend, you know, uh, if the test is gonna go over multiple days, how often do you get status updates? Uh, do you get a, uh, you know, a dedicated person uh, to, to deal with, things like that. Um, another thing is, uh, what are the qualifications that the testers have? So, this is honestly a thing that I have significant internal conflict with because as a person who does not have a college degree and who only recently started caring about certifications, um, you kind of want to have, you want to get an idea as to what, you know, what the, what the people who are going to be operating in your environment um, uh, have, I guess, as far as uh, qualifications, certifications like, uh, you know, CEH or uh, OS, uh, what is it, OCSP, um, those are, are, are good, uh, you know, good to haves. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, the kind of people, like get an idea as to what kind of people they have, like are they all, um, you know, are they all ex-NSA agents or, uh, you know, do they, you know, do they do teaching or, or what have you. Um, you know, obviously having a diverse group of people is, is always going to help. Uh, uh, in an environment, and especially because you'll get, uh, you know, if you get a if you get a get people who have a wide background, um, you'll be able to have a more effective test. Then, so this one, you might not get an answer on if you if you ask this, but uh, I I feel like it's worth asking. Um, do do the staff do presentations at conferences, or do they do podcast appearances? Do they have blog posts, uh, anything like that? So I would say that's not a requirement, but it kind of gives you an idea about the person and the, and the company's mindset. 
So here's an example. If you hear a present, if you, you know, you see a presentation from a person, um, you know, who's working at, at this company and they keep referring to their customers using derogatory terms like, oh yeah, we, we totally own these guys and they didn't know what was coming. Is that a person that you want operating in your environment? Maybe it is, maybe, but maybe it isn't. And, and again, it's not going to be, I wouldn't say it's a make or break, but it's another another way you can kind of gauge if, if this organization is a good fit for what you're trying to achieve. Um, the other the other thing is uh, like one time I um, I was listening to a podcast episode and it was excellent, but uh, in the description of of what they ended up going through, um, I felt that they took it too far uh, and that they might have um, you know done too much evil so to speak. And so, like, while it might have been a great fit for that organization, then they needed to have somebody who uh, would really take it to the next level because that's what their threat model would suggest that their adversaries would do. Me, personally, I would say I wouldn't want to hire that person. Um, again, it's, it's kind of, um, you know, getting an idea as to what you would want the people to do uh, would really help here. Uh, next is you want to get an idea as to what kind of tools they use. Um, just because companies are using off-the-shelf tools like Metasploit or, or, or something along those lines doesn't mean they're bad at it. Uh, if you have the uh, if you have the skills to run it yourself, you'd be doing it yourself. So, um, but getting getting a list of the tools gives you an idea as to what the capabilities are and what they're actually going to be performing on your systems. Uh, the other thing is when they're doing a vulnerability scan, which almost all engagement should be doing. Uh, it would be awesome if they used a vulnerability scanner that you do not use. So it kind of gives you a free uh, like a verification of your own internal system. Um, in in one engagement, uh, we found a pretty a pretty nasty uh, false negative, where our internal scanner didn't pick up this one vulnerability, but the vendors did, and it turned out that it was actually there. Um, next, always you know price is a concern. Uh, so what is their pricing model? Is it time? Is it based on the number of assets? Is it something else? Uh, the other thing is if they're doing an on-site work, if anyone ever does on-site work ever again, uh, you want to get an idea as to what the travel costs would, might be um, so that way you don't get a huge surprise at the end of it. Um, the other thing is, uh, at, you know, at the end of the day, you're dealing with professionals. So uh, they probably do way more tests than you do. So, you know, after going back and forth of the conversation, do they have any ideas that might help improve the scope? Uh, do they, you know, they think, you know, there might be places to expand it or maybe tighten it up? Um, or, you know, after, after talks like, okay, yeah, based on what you're talking about, you know, this web server or whatever, it's probably not gonna find anything, but we do wanna take a look at your Active Directory more off. You know, so let's, let's see if we can dedicate some more time to that. That's all. That's all useful. Um, and then again, if are there any other extras that uh, that might be helpful? So like, then not everyone is a used car salesman and they're just trying to tack on useless things. Uh, usually, you call a company and say, "Hey, I want a pen test." Okay, great. But then when you know when you're talking, you say, "Oh, you know what? They have you know you have this. Is there anything else that we that might benefit? Uh, like things like password audits or wireless." Um, wireless assessments or, you know, just firewall rule reviews or, or, or something. Even if you just do it once to get a get a perspective and, and you don't do it all the time, it's worth it to have a second set of eyes uh, take a look. Okay, so part two of the story. The actual test happens. So if you remember in, in, in the Phoenix project, in January, Sarah gets the boot and leaves Parts Unlimited. So if they're testing a bunch of Sarah systems, uh, she's not going to be able to be the scapegoat anymore. So Pentester's RS runs a test remotely. Um, then there were some delays um, on both sides, the busy schedules, you know, end of the year kind of stuff. Uh, they, find, um, they find some default creds on, on some store systems and they lead to uh, exploit and compromise of, of one of the stores. So a red team wins, right? You know, great. You you got findings, and you know you can you can go and 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 try to remediate that now. 
Uh, the problem was that overall, the experience wasn't really what they were expecting. The communication was kind of problematic. The delay, there were some delays. And then the report, like they saw the, the, the example report in the beginning of the phase. And then when they got one, it, it really didn't, they didn't think it was, it was good enough. They, you know, they asked for screenshots and, and there really weren't any. And it, it was just kind of like, you know, that's just what our tool provides. So, um, you know, that's, that's what you've got. So, um, pen test R R us starts calling back and say, hey, when are we going to schedule the next one? And Parts Unlimited says, you know, we're not really, we're not, we don't, we didn't really like the experience that that we had the last time. We're going to go with someone else. And you know, some, we're, it's a good idea to to rotate uh, rotate vendors. So we want to we want to try something else. And therein lies a problem. In their contract, they signed a multi-year test deal. Even though, but the the salesperson said, well, yeah, you can just get out of it whenever you want. Well, yeah, but the contract didn't actually say that. And you guys didn't exercise the right to, to, to switch when you were supposed to. Well, that's a bummer. Um, you know, so okay, let's let's do let's do a second test then. Uh, let's let's try it again. This time let's not let's let's try to minimize our delays. Let's have somebody come on site. So contracts, they're important. They suck but they're important. At the end of the day, the contract and the statement of work is what drives your engagement. You wanna make sure you get it right. So one of the things that's important, is there a non-disclosure agreement? Is it part of the SOW or is it actually a separate thing? And then what does it define as confidential and how does how is the confidentiality maintained? These are things that are important to have in there uh, because it sets expectations properly. I've seen um, I've seen uh, proposals where everything is confidential. Like you can't even say that we ever did business with you or others where, you know, it's a lot more uh, compartmentalized and says anything that only the things that we find out about your environment are, uh, are confidential and, you know, the conversations that we have and things like that. Um, the, the answer, it kind of just depends on, on, um, on, on, on your environment. Next is the license to your deliverable. Who owns the content of the report? And then who can see the completed reports? Uh, again, are the reports covered by the NDA so you can't ever show anyone them? Are they only allowed to be used internally? Can you show them to regulators? Can you just do anything you want with them? Uh, there's, uh, you know, I would say that there's, uh, it's a good idea to be able to share it, uh, but if the, if the license, if the contract says you can't, well, that's something you might wanna look into. Uh, is there a section on dispute resolution? That's important. Sometimes there isn't. And if you have a dispute, you're kind of stuck. And it's just kind of like a he said, she said situation. Uh, having a well-defined dispute resolution process uh, is, is good and important. For multi-year deals, double check how the severability works. I would say if you if a you know if a, if a company full of all NS, a former NSA agent says we're going to give you a 90% discount and uh, but you have to use us for five years would you take it? I don't know that you would because you've never worked with them and uh, you don't know realistically how how they're going to how the, how good of a fit it's going to be. But even if you do, you want to double check the early termination clause. Sometimes it's you have to terminate within a certain amount of time after you get deliverables or you have to do it within, uh, you know, before any, any, anything, any work is performed. Um, it's, you know, it, it depends, but it's a thing you should look at. Uh, the other thing is you could just say, don't do any multi-year deals. Uh, I think some flexibility and, you know, you might get, you might get uh, some discounting involved uh, if you do multi-year, um, but again, pay attention. Uh, ensure the contract and the SOW includes examples of attacks that are in scope and that aren't in scope. Uh, so for example, uh, oftentimes you would exclude uh, DDoS attacks or anything specifically uh, designed to take down your systems. Um, that's you know usually the case, but if you care about your availability and you want to test how, how well your systems 
you know, behave under a DDoS. Well, you want to make sure that that's in the scope. Or if you care about, uh, you know, certain other classes of exploits or vulnerabilities, uh, you want to make sure that that they're in there. At the very least, you want to you want to have something that says what isn't in scope, uh, so that if, you know, if uh, if someone accidentally or, or or mistakenly exceeds what they're supposed to, causes a problem, there's some protection for both sides. And again, realistically, at the end of the day, you want a contract to be fair. Um, if if it seems like it's weighted in one direction or another, have a discussion. Maybe there's something that they can they can change about it. Um, other things, uh, as in most contract work, uh, weird things that you find in a contract might indicate that the company giving it to you has had a history of that problem. And so maybe double check or, you know, don't just say, oh, yeah, that's not a big deal. Uh, ask, like ask why that's in there or if they can give an explanation. Um, if, you know, if you see it like a non-disparagement clause or or something where, you know, the damages include unlimited liability instead of uh, some limit. Uh, you could be exposing yourself to significant financial risk uh, that you probably don't want to. Uh, realistically, at the end of the day, you're hiring a vendor, and this is a lot of vendor due, due, due diligence. Um, and, you know, some, some work uh, beforehand really will help out in the end. Oops. So, and then the other thing is... Uh, you want to get examples of letters of authorizations, otherwise known as get a jail free cards or the rules of engagement or, or something. You want to get that in advance. Um, oftentimes you will have that kind of given to you the day of or the day before uh, that the actual attacks would happen or just some, some time before. And they sometimes have terms and conditions that are in addition to what the original SOW was. So you want to get a chance to take a look at those before you actually have to sign it. You don't want you don't want the time the day you sign it to be the first day that you see this. Again, before before you engage, double check some of that information um, and uh, make sure that it's it it works for you. Okay. So back to pen testers are us. <clears throat> Excuse me. So they grudging you know they grudgingly go on with the second test. So this time they're gonna they're gonna test uh, a new a different system, Project Unicorn. Pen testers are us comes on site, and they they find there's a bunch of super critical vulnerabilities on all on a lot of these systems. We're talking you know CVSS 10 scores. All the systems were clones of each other for uh, you know for the rapid scaling, and they all contain this vulnerability that that somehow just wasn't noticed but there were no systems exploited or compromised so john and bill just think okay uh maybe it was a false positive so when they get the report uh it pretty much just says you know fix all these vulnerabilities but especially this critical vulnerability even though we couldn't exploit it um so john and bill push back and say well we'll if you couldn't exploit it, why are you including it in the report? Uh, if you know, if you, if it wasn't exploitable, it might not be a false positive. You should have, you know, that's that's probably not well, the first thing that we should be focusing on. And the only answer they can get is, well, that's you know, that's that's the worst vulnerability you have. You really need to fix that. Well, oftentimes, you know, we'll get uh, you get into an arguing match with a vendor and you say, well, can you show us proof? I'm sure that. Pen test companies hate it when the customer says, show us the proof. Um, but sometimes you really need to ask for it. And in this case, uh, pen testers or us just said, well, we can really just give you, you know, the output of our tool. That's, you know, the raw output is as good as you're going to get. Um, you know, that's, that's what we've got. So they put Brent to work. Brent can fix everything. Brent. Can you guys, can you take a look at the raw output of this pool, uh, at this tool? Well, you know, it's 10,000 pages of, of weird like CSV outputs that's formatted for printing. That, that's kind of annoying. Um, but yeah, let's see what I can do. Okay, so uh, after a few days of working on it, we figured out that they ran all these different exploits. None of them were for software that we actually were running in Project Unicorn. 
well, what about that that CVSS 10 vulnerability that they found? The exploit for that's not on this list. Well, what did they run? They ran a bunch of attacks against Apache. We run Nginx, not Apache in our systems. Yeah, and we found in the raw vulnerability data that they knew that we don't run Apache. Um, so they ran the attacks anyway, because so they know it wouldn't have worked. So, you know, Bill says, well, we wanted a pen test, and they gave us a pencil, just a bunch of number two. Um, sometimes that's what happens. Reporting. Uh, the report is the thing you care about at the end of the day, because uh, that's what's gonna that you're gonna take to your board of directors, to your auditors, compliance, whoever, and it's also going to be the blueprint for how you fix whatever findings there are. So, before the uh, before they finish with all the work, uh, usually they're gonna tell you if something is super critical or if there's evidence of prior uh, prior exploitation or, or uh, you know, or anything else. Um, so you want to get a good idea of what the findings are before they, before they leave. Um, make sure that, um, make sure that if they find a vulnerability that exists in a lot of places that is exploitable and they think is super critical, do they actually try to exploit it? Um, because, you know, Again, like in the example, if they didn't, and it, and it could be a, just a false positive. Also, make sure they try to document all the exploits that they did try, or all the all the attacks, or or, or whatever. Um, so this is actually this is very useful uh, for verifying that you actually have a working system. Um, you know. If something, if they, if they tried an attack and it failed, and you can prove, uh, if you can provide evidence that you know some of your system blocked it or there was an alert that uh, that triggered in a sock, that's that means that your security program is working, and you want to highlight that. Um, pen test reports shouldn't always be, yep, we own the system and we got domain admin and three clicks, and you know everyone's horrible at the job. Sometimes you 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 know you want to say, yep, we're doing a good job, and here's how. And we made it really hard, even though you know there were some minor findings or whatever. Um, so you knew where all the bodies were buried, and sometimes you find out that pen tests just find more bodies. This is the great thing about having a third party; um, they think differently than your internal folks. Uh, they might find something that you had no idea was there, or come up with a different uh, a different way of exploiting uh, a configuration or or whatever. Um, you know, again, be prepared to fail. Uh, no one's perfect, so uh, you know the, the bad guys have to be right once. The good guys have to be right every single time in order to prevent, uh, uh, you know, a security incident. So um, it's better that that a that a pen test company does uh, does the attacking and and shows you where the weaknesses are than a real attacker does it. Um, you know. Just because you know someone got domain admin doesn't mean people should be losing their jobs. Uh, so, if, if that's a problem, you might have just a company culture problem too. Um, the other thing is, if there are not a lot of findings, make sure to include examples of the detections or the log files or alerts um, uh, where you show that the attacks are are failing, um, because that helps. Um, that helps a lot of avoiding worries that the company didn't actually do what they were supposed to. Uh, you know, it also gives the blue team kind of an attaboy uh, that, that they're doing everything right. Um, honestly, one of the best engagements I've ever participated in uh, was, you know, me and another pen, and a pen tester kind of sitting in the same room. And as they were carrying out the attack, uh, they, you know, they said, okay, I'm doing X, Y, and Z. And I said, okay, yep, I'm seeing it log here and here and here. And you know, yep, we're, we're blocking you at this path and, and, and here. And we took screenshots of that and included it in the report. And it was honestly like the, like it's literally the, you know, the idea of Purple Team. And it was great because we showed that realistically that, you know, in this one system that we were testing, 
there was, you know, it was set up exactly the way it could, be, the best way it could be. Uh, and there was evidence to show that that was the case. And there was evidence to show that it was repelling all of these sophisticated attacks, which really gave everybody the warm and fuzzy feeling that we could bring it live and it was going to work. Um, the other thing is that um, the remediation plan that you get at the end of the report realistically needs to be doable. Um, so a lot of times, like oftentimes, uh, the, the companies I've dealt with, they are very amenable to, uh, you know, to say something like, you know, well, what do you suggest we do? What would recommend, you know, recommend that you do for this kind of a thing if it's, you know, if it's kind of off the wall. So, you know, if you scope the test, uh, physical test, and, um, you know, someone uses a missile launcher to break through a wall and get into your data center, you know, probably a pen test company is going to say, you really need to armor that wall. Um, but realistically, that's not going to happen. Uh, if that's not real, if that's, if no one thinks that's a realist, you know, uh, a worthwhile effort. So instead, you might say, okay, well, great. Yeah, you got the missile launcher uh, and, and blew up the wall. How about you say that we have an awareness campaign so that if people see a missile launcher, they say something. That might be, you know, that's kind of uh, uh, a way around it. Uh, if, if, you know, again, uh, the company is probably going to tell you, you know, the best possible way. But realistically, sometimes you kind of need to meet in the middle as far as uh, something that's actually achievable. Uh, also, if you scope the pen test where a missile launcher is in scope, uh, kudos, you know. Um, but that's um, that's actually all I have for now. Uh, and I, I feel like it kind of took an abrupt end, and I apologize, but we're kind of running close on time. I want to give a special shout out and thanks to Investigator Chick. Uh, Kathy, she helped me put together my abstracts for when I was uh, submitting this, uh, really helped me solidify it. And uh, P. Laverty 9, Patrick, always an uh, awesome uh, person for bouncing questions and ideas off of. And obviously, he organizes this and other conferences. Awesome guy in general, overall. So finally, uh, are there any questions? Hey, Dimitri. Hey. hey. Okay. First of all, yeah. That talk was fantastic. We only have a couple minutes for questions um, yeah, before sorry. we get into the next. No, it's totally fine. I personally just want to say this is like shameless plug, but I used to work for a pen testing firm. So I was super appreciative of how much depth you went into on the scoping side of things because I feel like we often have to evangelize security to some of these companies. Um, to get them to actually sign off on some of the scope that we want to do as pen testers. And so I just really, really appreciated it. Um, and with that, there was one question that came from Frobius, which is how do we best educate people, organizations, or companies that, and in this case, it's running a Nessa scan and printing the report is not a pen test. Um, but in general, like how do we evangelize security and help get them to actually like sign up for the work that we want to do? So honestly, in my experience, and and so this is just me, I am guarantee you someone is gonna tell you that this is absolutely wrong, and that's perfectly fine. If this was an in-person thing, I'd say, let's give me a ginger ale and we'll talk about it later. Sometimes you really just need to be scared into it. Um, and not necessarily scared, but if you can, you know, if you can prove that, 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 the, that the need exists by, you know, running one of the tools yourself mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, or at least, you know, explain to someone in concise terms that, you know, okay, here's exactly how I would do it. And I would take this one vulnerability over here and then use that to get a, you know, a hash and then pass the hash over there. That's not something that you realistically can detect with a vulnerability scanner. A vulnerability scanner just says this one problem exists on this one computer or all these computers. It really takes, you know, a human person um to, to to put it all together and say here's an attack path that you know that will realistically you know cause you problems that where just single vulnerabilities on their own might not necessarily uh, rise to that level 
Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, again, like nobody asked for my opinion. I'm just going <laughs> to give it to everybody. Yeah, no. But um, like I have seen so many examples, especially on network pen tests, where you know a Nessus scan might print out a like a bunch of like low and medium vulnerabilities, and then we can take those low medium vulnerabilities and daisy chain them together to something that's critical. So you wouldn't have that human element telling you that all of these are kind of intertwined and can result in some privilege escalation and really bad vulnerabilities if you were just looking at this printout, right? Yeah, I mean, breach and attack simulation is a new kind of world where theoretically they can do that, but I think realistically, there's always going to need to be a person there. Um, I agree. Doing it. I agree, but I'm biased. Um, we have time for one more question, Bye. which is from Yo Diggity. Uh, they are curious about your thoughts on crowdsource pen testing options that are starting to gain momentum. Um, for example, Bug Crowd has several varieties, Hacker One, uh, Bug Bounty programs. What do you think? So I think it's um, I think it's a it's a great direction to go, and I they're realistically. Um, they're a good fit for a lot of organizations and not some others. I, I feel like you need to have a significant level of maturity to really get the most use out of it and may, and some critical mass of size. So like my experience has been a lot with midsize and, and small organizations. So um, most of the companies that I've dealt with probably don't rise to the level of needing a bug bounty program, uh, but it's um, I think it's worthwhile. And you know, this, the problem is you end up with with uh, pr people who are not being, um, you don't want to end up as being per someone who's not playing by the rules or not being like a good corporate citizen, where you're not really giving the the, you know, the bug bounty people, uh, you know, their their due, so to speak. Um, I, I'm not a fan of companies that just kind of hide their, you know, stick their heads in the sand and avoid problems. And um, it's been publicized where like some. You know that some the, I guess the if we could fix the abuse of the bug bounty system, I think that would be overall much better. Um, but it's it's worthwhile. Again, it's it's you all these kinds of questions that I brought up in here. You should be asking of of that provider asking how they you know how they would how they would tackle it and how it works and and how how it really melds with what what your processes are. Totally. I just couldn't agree more. Dimitri, I really appreciate it. You absolutely blew us away with that talk. I was not even surprised to to learn that um, because I had very high expectations and you exceeded them. Um, but really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. And please pop into the Discord channel for any additional questions. Yeah, um, I'm, in, I'm in Discord. Point, totally, so. Perfect. I will be available on uh, Discord for question and answer. And this is bibliography. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, everyone.